Institute of Creation Research in San Diego, who is a friend of mine, uh, who died recently, sadly. And he uh, asked me if I wanted to go work on a dinosaur site. Well, you, you helped me answer this question. At that time, I was working in Peru on fossil whales. Thousands of fossil whales that are buried in the Pisco Formation in, in southern Peru. And so I was very involved in that project. We published some major papers. Uh, and we were doing, doing this research on the, on the taphonomy of the whales. And taphonomy, as you'll learn, is the science of studying what happens to things from the time they're alive and walking around until you dig them up. So it's everything, what they were doing when they died, what killed them, what happened after they died, what happened when they were buried, and then how did you find them when you, when you dug them up. So that's the science of taphonomy. You might uh, know this from, if you ever watched crime scene investigation, crime scene investigators use taphonomists to try to reconstruct the time of death of the individual involved. And they do amazing experiments. They take uh, human cadavers that donate their bodies for science. They put them out in the woods or somewhere out in the desert, and they leave them there. And then they go every few days and they find out what state the body's in. And as time goes on, they chronicle the rate of disarticulation and disintegration of the body. And that it sounds pretty gruesome, but the people that do this uh, are uh, like it. They like that kind of stuff. So anyway, that's taphonomy. And so we were doing the same thing with dinosaurs. What happened to this animal? How long did it sit around before it was buried? And after it was buried, what happened to the bones? So we were doing that with the fossil whales down in Peru. And I was really enjoying the prod project. Who wouldn't enjoy working down in southern Peru? It's a wonderful, wonderful country, a beautiful place. And it's on the Atacama Desert, which for a geologist is like being in heaven because there are no plants there. And no means no plants that grow in the Atacama Desert because it never rains there. And never means never. In fact, uh, in that area of Peru and other places, the people don't even put roofs on their house. They just stretch a tarp across the four walls, and that's, that's their house. So it's, it's, really, it's really true. It never rains there. So that means there are no plants there. Well, there is one plant, and that one plant grows. It's an epiphyte, like a pineapple, bromeliad, and that plant grows in among the rocks. And you can pick it up and put it in your pocket and take it somewhere else and put it down. They, aren't, they don't have any roots because there's no reason to be rooted. So what happens is at nighttime, the mist comes in from the ocean because the ocean's very cold. And that's why they don't get any rain because the ocean is cold. It doesn't, it doesn't have much evaporation. So at nighttime, a mist will come in from the ocean and it'll condense on the plants. So that's how they get their water. And then the little beetles will come along and they'll get the water off the plants. And then the little mice come along and they'll get their food off the beetles. And then the little coyotes, the, uh, sorry, the foxes come along and they eat the, the mice. And then the, that's, there is a whole food chain there out in this desert where there's no water. Anyway, that's, that's what I was doing. That sounds like fun, doesn't it? So I said, no, I'm not really interested in that right now. I'm, my plate's full. And I called a friend of mine who was in, I'm sorry, something was, oh. <laughs> I called a friend of mine who lived in Southern Oregon off the grid. And asked him, he was a vertebrate paleontologist, so I thought maybe he'd be interested in dinosaurs. So I called him and I said, okay, there's a project over here in, and Utah, would you like to go take a look at it and see if you're interested? So he said, well, he was working on fossil mammals in California. I said, well, it'd be, at least go out and look. So he finally consented, and he went out and looked at it. And later on that summer, he and I were on a field trip, a geological field trip, where we were taking people around the 
Western United States of, and showing them geological phenomena. And when we were done, we ended up in Idaho. And he said, why don't you just come with me and we'll go over and look at that place. And so he took me over there. And I ended up here on the Hanson Ranch. And Mr. Glenn Hanson, who uh, was in his 70s at that time, uh, took me in his pickup truck, his old Chevy pickup truck, up onto, onto a ridge. And he said, okay, get out. And that ridge was just down there by, just on the other side of North Quarry. He said, get out and I'll show you around. And I started to get out. And I think deliberately he had put me right in a bunch, in the midst of a pile of dinosaur bones. So I could not step on the ground when I got out of the car without walking on dinosaur bones. Now, I don't know how he knew that that would affect me this way, but that shocked me because I could see these dinosaur bones washing away year after year and being lost to science. And I couldn't handle that. It actually made me sick to think that this day, these data were being lost and would never be recovered again. We're not making more dinosaurs and they're fairly rare. So this, is, this really bothered me. So when I left there and went back, I talked on the way home with Dr. Spencer and he and I uh, decided that we'd like to go back the following year. So, and, and by the way, that year before I got there, he and uh, Dr. Kurt Weiss had talked to the family. At that time, there was a group here who were kind of family, family campers who wanted to dig up dinosaur bones, but there really wasn't any science in it, and they were doing a real bad job. They went out and they collected all the bones on the surface. And once you take away the bones on the surface, you don't know where the bones are, right? So they had really messed things up uh, badly. But these two, these two paleontologist friends of mine said, let's give them a place to dig where they can't hurt, every, hurt anything. And they went over and they found this spot, and I'll tell you where it is in a minute, that they thought was a slump. So all the bones would have been moved out of place, and they really wouldn't be, mean anything in terms of their science and taphonomy. And uh, so those people dug there that season. Uh, the next season, I brought back, they, then they, let, they wouldn't let them come anymore because they weren't doing approved science. And they, the Hanson Research Station was established, and the HRS Foundation was established, and they started making rules about who could come. And the rules were you had to do good science, and you had to do science that was credible, and it had to be approved by them before, before you come out here. So as a result, these people left. And that next season, I brought a group of, of teachers out here uh, to spend two weeks. That's, that's how long we, we dug. Spend two weeks digging in, in uh, this one spot. So we went back to that same spot that they had been assigned to work in. And we worked there. And we, we found a lot of bones. In fact, we found uh, a lot of bones. And we started using super glue then because the rest of the paleontologists were using a, a weak solution that could be easily reversed, but it took a long time to apply, and it took a long time to dry, and it wasn't very strong. And I knew super glue set fast. And that's the kind of guy I am, so I said, OK, let's use super glue. So we started using super glue that first year. And uh, so that was one of the innovations we did, because other paleontologists didn't do that. Uh, the next year, we couldn't get a class together. So uh, Dr. Spencer and I came out of here by ourselves. And then the following year, that was 1999, we decided to teach a class out here. And so we advertised it around campus, and we ended up with one student. I'm not a salesman. I, I'm not very good at that kind of stuff, so I, I wasn't able to convince people to do this. And so I had one student, and the school said, well, you can't teach a class for one student with, with uh, uh, paying a professor. 
So I got a colleague of mine to come along. He was a physicist named Larry Turner. And uh, he and I enrolled in our own class. So there were three of us. So that year we taught a class. And, and uh, I was a student in the class as well as the teacher. <laughs> that way the school would allow us to go. So we came out here and we taught that class. And we dug in that same quarry again. And then from then on, things exploded. In 2000, the first year uh, that we had a, a significant number of people here, we were living not in a place like this. We had an old trailer house, uh, what do you call it, mobile home. We had an old mobile home that sat down where the dig site is, where the uh, uh, RV site is now. And it had been through a hailstorm that knocked out a lot of the windows and put dents all over the thing. So it was really ugly. And, but that was our headquarters. We cooked our food there and we lived in tents and, and that, that worked out okay. That was the year 2000. We had about 20 people there that year. And we dug in that same site. And guess where that site is? North Quarry. North Quarry, where you guys are digging today. We've been digging in that same quarry since 1996. That's, uh, I don't know how long that is, about 27 years, I suppose. But that's a long time in that one quarry. We're not done yet, are we? You think we got all the bones out of there? I walked around today and looked at your bones, and I'm astonished. You guys are bringing out stuff, amazing stuff, every day. And so... That was, that was uh, the start of something big. And so we invited a, the city planner of the city of Denver to come out and build us a shelter out there so we have a place to work underneath uh, to protect us from the sun and so on. He, he developed an innovative technique of setting up a wood frame and then putting fiberglass window screen on top and then putting acrylic saturated cement. So instead of putting water in the cement, he put acrylic in the cement. As a result, it was very flexible. And so he was making these shelters. There was a big earthquake in Managua that destroyed the marketplace down there. He went down to Managua and built these kind of shelters for them down there. So he had a lot of experience at it. So he built us one of those shelters. And uh, so we had that, and we had the, the mobile home. And the next year, the mobile home was, it didn't have electricity. It didn't have sewer. It didn't have, oh, it did have sewer. Yeah, they had put in a, a leech line down there and connected it. So we did have a toilet for 20 people and, and a shower for 20 people. And, and uh, the... It was, it, it was just obvious, the thing was falling apart, so they took it out the next year and they built us a, uh, one of the huts, just like down there, but with walls. It had two of these structures with the cement on, on the window screen over the top, and then one of them we used for a kitchen, the other had the bathrooms and the research lab, and that was the way we lived since 2001 until 2019 when a storm came through and this window screen is great but you have to maintain it and they had decided they would shortcut the process and not make the roof too steep so they made it shallow and as a result it would puddle water and the water would sit there on the roof and work its way through water is amazing it can work its way through any little tiny hole and so it started leaking inside so he brought more stuff up and put it on there and it got heavier and heavier. And the heavier it got, the more it leaked. And, uh, and the walls started rotting and the floor was rotting out. And then along came a windstorm in 2019 and, and uh, huffed and puffed and blew it all away. And so it just disappeared all at once. We weren't without expectation on this. We were hoping that would happen <laughs> because we, didn't, we couldn't get the HRS of which I'm a member, we couldn't get them to commit to building the building. They didn't want to, they, they wanted to fix the one they had. 
And so this went on for so many years that eventually it just, it just fell apart. So the next two years, we got man camps. We had two man camps in there, which had two showers and two bathrooms each, and a bedroom and a kitchen. And we used one of them for a kitchen in the ladies' restrooms and the other one for the men in the research facility. But you can imagine what that was like. Uh, meantime, we decided we needed a new building. And so in uh, 2020, we started researching what would be needed. We brought some people out here to look at it. Uh, and we convinced them that we really needed this building. So Maranatha, which is a Christian organization that builds mission projects all over the world, uh, they uh, came out and they looked at the project. They had a top architect uh, come out and design the building for us. And then a friend of mine talked to a bunch of his friends and raised the money for us to, to, to build it. And it was a lot of money, a lot of money. And uh, I would guess if you had to pay for everything in this building, it would be about $2 million. Uh, we had a lot donated. All the, all the, most of the work was donated. The foundation was donated by uh, some friends of mine who they, they brought in 20 trucks, 20 cement trucks. Over that road you came in in? 20 cement trucks in one day. Uh, came from um, Cheyenne? No, what's that town north of you? No, the next one north. The bigger one. What is it? Gillette. Gillette. Yeah, Gillette. Sorry. Yeah, I think it was up in Gillette somewhere. Anyway, it was a long ways. And all of that, we paid not one penny for. And so we, we have really been blessed. And, and the man that built the building, he had his own ideas about what it ought to be. This building was designed to withstand 110 mile an hour winds. And that's conservative, so probably it would, it would stand a lot more. This roof, these are insulated panels with four inches of foam in between. So it's steel on the inside, steel on the outside, and four inches of foam in the middle. So even when it's hot outside, the, sun, the heat of the sun doesn't come through the roof. It has to go somewhere else. And if we get hot, we can open all these doors all the way around. These doors, when they're finished, will just slide out of the way. These doors will all slide out of the way. And so we'll have openness all the way around. And that's what we wanted because we lived out in the open all these years. We had, we had that little house down there, but we basically lived in a tent, a big circus tent that was outside. And uh, so we wanted that same feeling because it was a beautiful feeling of being outside in this, in this gorgeous place. So that's why this building is reflective of, of that wish to have the outside inside. And of course, having cooking facilities like this, have you seen the kitchen? Ask for a tour of the kitchen. Uh, somebody will take you through and show it to you. It's beautiful. And uh, the bathrooms, instead of going in a little shabby man camp bathroom, or before that, our shabby bathrooms, uh, we have very nice bathrooms. I came down there two weeks ago, and that white stuff you see in the bathroom, in the showers, uh, myself and John and Mikey's mother and Aaron Maloney and Wallace came down together in the truck, and we spent a week here putting up painting. These guys are painting, and we were putting up that miserable white plastic stuff on ceilings and walls. And uh, it's, it's really wild. It was a lot of fun. And so uh, as a result of the work we've done here, we've published six or seven papers in the scientific literature, one major paper. And then um, we've had papers on individual bones that we found. And we've had papers on, on different quarries that we've excavated. And one, on, one of our papers was on the techniques that we pioneered, which I'll tell you about in, in our lecture on hopefully tomorrow night. So uh, we're going to go in detail into uh, the, the techniques that we developed here on this site 
this, this small Christian organization has pioneered techniques that are, that are state of the art in paleontology today for everybody. And all I can say is, as I'll tell you tomorrow when I give the lecture, uh, all I can say is uh, God is good and he has done amazing things for us. And I really appreciate that. And every time I look around this building, I'm in awe of what God has wrought. So uh, that's kind of a rundown of a little bit of the history. It's more complex than that, but just a rundown of uh, some of the elements of the history here. Any questions? The mass of bones was remobilized by maybe an earthquake because we have lots of evidence of earthquakes. If you look at these rocks around here, the, the sandstone rocks, you'll see that they, they're all contorted because they were deposited extremely rapidly and before the water could escape from the, the sand, they were, they were moved by an earthquake. So we see a lot of evidence of this kind of stuff going on. So I think probably what happened was these sediments got remobilized and they just moved out into deeper water. And so that's why they ended up in a graded bed with big bones at the bottom and little bones on top. You could only get that if you had a bunch of bones that you moved all at one in one event. And as they moved, the bigger bones settled to the bottom and the smaller bones settled up higher. So that's, that's why I think they're here. You should know, you should know that this is probably, I, I don't like saying this, but I like you people, so I'm gonna tell you, this is probably the largest bone bed in the world, at least as far as I know. I don't wanna say it because, oh, I just did. I don't wanna say it because I don't want somebody saying, oh, if that's the biggest bone bed in the world, we need to go kick these people out of there and preserve it. Yes. Um, one quick question. So um, for the amount of sediment that we have removed throughout the, uh, throughout the entire years we've been here, how far has the actual sediment gone down due to us? And then how far has it gone down due to other pe uh, like the actual natural progression of it? Because how many bones did we save? Like how much material did we save? Because we've been out here for like 27 years, so that's a lot of data to be able to see that distance. Yeah, we, we've seen just in the last few weeks we've seen some bones that are eroding out that we want to try to save. In, they're actively being removed right now and, and will be lost unless we go and, go and save them. And there are some right across the ridge from your quarry where erosion has cut a hole uh, through a place where there's some bones. So there are bones being lost, but the ones we're digging up are not being lost. They're being, they're being uh, taken care of and chronicled and put into the, uh, into the collection and they'll be there in the repository for the, for the foreseeable future. Yes. <laughs> to protect these bones, to preserve them, and to allow them to be used for scientific investigation. And that's why we've de developed this website, which has been described as the best website in the world for seeing dinosaur fossils. The best in the world. Uh, that includes the Smithsonian and Yale and, and Berkeley and all those other places. Our website is better than those by far. And you, you'll see why when I give this lecture in a couple of days. Yeah. Um, I know in the past, on the weekend, like on Sabbath, sometimes you guys had gone out to go dig for dinosaur bones where people could keep them. Is that something you guys still do? No. Uh, there, there are times when we've gone to a site uh, on the ranch that we allowed people to keep things that we didn't want. They would bring stuff back and then we'd go through it, take out the important stuff and they could keep other things. But th there will be a chance for you to take home some, some specimens if your quarry leaders allow it. So, but, but that's only by permission because they do belong to the Hansons and we take that very seriously. But that site you're talking about is now a quarry. <laughs> so we can't do that anymore. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, Thank you, Doctor. I tomorrow's another that. day. It's another day. And it will be more exciting than today. Thank you.